The next session is called uh, Present Digital Part 2. And uh, yesterday we had Part 1, which uh, was with uh, Brian uh, Dradkor, uh, Maria Parra Fernandez, and um, Lucas Amaka. Um, and these, both these sessions, in a way, are connections to what's happening next door in Art Dubai Digital. This is the second year of that um, initiative, that space, a kind of experiment. Um, and uh, last year, it was very much initiated and driven by Chris Fussner, um, here on your right. And um, Chris continues uh, in a kind of consultant capacity this year and brought on board Clara Pay, uh, who was um, exhibiting uh, her DAO last year, uh, NFT Asia, and now she's been curating that um, the new, this year's space. And we also have uh, Audrey uh, Oo, o, but perhaps Chris, um, through the conversation that he's about to initiate, will um, you know will get into more details about what both Audrey and uh, Clara do. Um, so if you please join me in welcoming Chris, Clara, and Audrey. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris Fussner. So uh, yeah, thank you for the kind introduction, Schumann. And also a big uh, thank you to the Art Dubai team uh, giving me the space and you know uh, wherewith to work and help develop the digital section last year. Um, so aside from that, I'm founder of Tropical Futures Institute, a multidisciplinary creative studio formerly based in Cebu, Philippines. We used to um, have a, a broad cultural programming around exhibitions, uh, zine fests, um, new media shows, and whatnot. Um, and yeah, so this year, as Shimon was saying, I'm helping in the background, working with Clara and the team um, on Art Dubai. And yeah, uh, but yeah, thank you for joining Present Digital Part Two. Uh, we're looking at the forces that are shaping the digital art and crypto landscape, NFT landscape. Um, and happy to be here with uh, Audrey and Clara. Uh, Audrey, um, Audrey O, CEO of TR Lab and co-founder, and Clara Pei, uh, co-founder um, of NFT Asia and the current uh, head curator of the digital section. And I think one of the things that are binding us all together is really this idea of bridging. And I think this sort of, what I mean by bridging is sort of connecting networks or connecting, I would say, spaces in the art world like bridging the traditional art world with the digital and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, uh, without further ado, I'll let, uh, I think, Clara, your slides are, are up first. So Audrey and, and Clara will introduce themselves and then we'll break into a discussion about some, some of the ideas in the, in the landscape right now. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Shimon, for having us and Chris for the introduction. Um, so just to give sort of a quick insight into my independent sort of curator practice, uh, what I do personally, and then I'll go deeper into building together with NFT Asia and what that's like. But I would say, yeah, like Chris said, um, everything that I've sort of been focusing on for the past couple of years is really centered on this idea of bridging. Um, between different kinds of worlds. Um, so first, I'll sort of look at uh, the curating bit of that bridging. Um, so one of the sort of recent shows that I worked on with Art on the Blockchain um, was Right Click and Save um, in 2021. So at that time when we first um, were working on this exhibition, which was going to be Singapore's first large scale sort of NFT show, um, it was an opportune time. I had just heard that uh, an owner who has a space inside the Freeport in Singapore was open to working on an exhibition, something that would have you know public access, uh, which is super rare and um, wanted to sort of take up that opportunity opportunity to open up the Freeport um, and have the exhibition there, but at the same time also to think about, um, you know, a lot of people were sort of drawing parallels between buying and selling NFTs to having works inside of the Freeport, um, or more broadly really thinking about what value um, with, you know, art and the markets around it would look like with these new emerging markets and ecosystems. Um, so I thought it was quite 
funny to have the show inside the Free Fort. Um, and so that show was broadly categorized into four main threads. Um, when we were working on the show, we very much recognized that, um, especially in like late 2021, there wasn't this in-depth, um, I would say, uh, widespread interest or, or knowledge of what NFTs were. It was just this buzzword that was you know, being thrown around. Um, so as the curator of the show, I really wanted to sort of focus on some of the more historic projects, um, visual and sort of cultures that have been building around and on blockchain um, prior to or, you know, right on um, this kind of um, on, I guess, boom of like NFTs. Um, so this first room that I have up here now um, really looked into Bitcoin or like Bitcoin history, sort of early projects around Bitcoin. Um, not in this photo, but Sarah Mayo Hess's Bitcoin, uh, which was created in 2015 one of the earliest projects um, of artists creating their own you know, blockchain and thinking about art financial value. Um, the second room, uh, I wanted to focus in more on sort of works that are digitally native. Um, so I paired uh, Andy Warhol's digital painting that was sold um, earlier 2021 at Christie's. Um, it was retrieved sort of in around 2014 um, when the Warhol Foundation was working on his solo um, from like floppy disks and the team then sort of restored the file so it was a format that's you know readable uh, today. So really thinking about that speed of uh, digital innovation or software developing over the years. How do you conserve sort of digital art? What does that mean now with things being on-chain? What is on-chain permanence? Um, and exploring that in relation to um, generative artworks like uh, this is Ringers by Dmitry Cherniak, um, which is something we would call fully like on-chain generative art um, because the artwork itself, which is in uh, code, uh, is minted directly on the blockchain. And that's sort of a different um, process to when you mint, let's say, a JPEG or an MP4 file. Um, and we can maybe get into that technical bit um, outside if you would like. Um, but something um, else that we wanted to include in the show as well was um, Pepe the Frog memes. Um, so before they were sort of co-opted uh, for, I guess, different political, uh, by different political groups, um, around 2014-15 on online forums on 4chan and Reddit, there were actually different groups uh, really coalescing around Pepe memes and derivatives, uh, rare Pepe's. Um, and there was this idea in those forums um, of scarcity. So um, I wasn't tuned in then, but I guess this is sort of like online forums now looking back said that, you know, in, in the forums at the time, uh, people wouldn't post these memes too often because they didn't want to flood the market. Um, it was a niche community and they really wanted to keep it niche. Um, and people were also trading and buying these meme derivatives on eBay. Um, so this was back in right 2015 or so, and so there were already these ideas um, that were circulating around communities that were probably also very close to or uh, connected to um, the blockchain communities at that time um, that were looking at uh, visual assets uh, in this light. So just to give a bit of that um, historical context, um, but onwards to a show that I curated more recently, uh, proof of concept which builds on top of sort of right click and save um, to be reflecting upon what has kind of happened in maybe that year and a half that's passed since um, what's happening in the space now but also to sort of build on top of um, I guess the fact that you know I think the conversations around NFTs art on the blockchain has um, from my perspective, matured, um, and now perhaps we're more ready to actually talk deeper about the technology, about what is actually being built um, and contested and experimented with. Um, so with this show, I worked with a lot more sort of works that are running uh, live generative software, uh, thinking about having more interactivity in the exhibition space. Um, 
both of these shows were very much targeted to like the general audience. Um, so I imagined maybe at least 80, 85% of the visitors would have no uh, deep relationship with blockchain or NFTs. And if that was the case, uh, what were the kinds of works and experiences that we could present um, that could maybe pique their interest or demonstrate the multiplicity of what's going on around this ecosystem to then invite someone to have that deeper relationship? Um, so well, I guess I won't get into this, but um, one of the works that um, we really were sort of like talking deeply with the artist um, about for its display is uh, Tyler Hobbs QQL, um, which is uh, this web-based sort of interface that the artisan studio created um, that allows you to go onto the website qql.art um, to then sort of play around with the different uh, parameters and then generate your own sort of generative art um, really that look into what a generative art could look like at being accessible. Um, so instead of showing individual outputs from the show, we decided instead to just have it as an interactive setup um, so people could come and experience it themselves um, and I guess make that whole process um, just a little more tangible. So I guess both of these exhibitions have really been looking into uh, that area of how can we make these conversations um, more tangible by bringing them into physical spaces? How can we introduce a level of uh, relation like interactions or you know just affective kind of experiences that are different from just viewing them online. Um, so I'm just gonna skip through this very quickly um, to then maybe find alignment, um, talk a bit more <laughs> about building community. Um, so um, I ran this collective, NFT Asia, alongside 10 other artists. We started NFT Asia in 2021, coming into the space and realizing that there were very few sort of platforms or conversations devoted to the wider Asian continent and its diaspora at that time. Um, and even now, really not perhaps a new problem um, in the art world, but with this new ecosystem, we were wondering, could we do anything that's different? Uh, could we create alternative platforms? Could we create digital ways of collectivizing um, that could you know, maybe shift some of these power structures or create new uh, support for artists? Also keeping in mind a lot of the artists in our community have not had access to you know, curators who are art historically trained, uh, who have no conception of say like how to write your artist bio, how to talk about yourself, much less how to protect yourself or uh, think about your longer term practice within this wider art context. Um, so with the group, we've sort of started with like a five person discord. Um, and now we've kind of grown into we focus much more on our Discord, I guess, this like 4,000 plus member space um, that's open to anyone. So you can all join us today um, and take part in conversation. Um, and we focus on three main areas. The first area is really to look at um, how can we support artists in terms of skills building and sharing? And a lot of times it's just giving space to conversations, allowing there to be a safe space within this hyper-financialized ecosystem um, that's actually artist-centric, led by artists, for artists, and you know, governed by artists' interests um, to discuss anything really in the space. Um, the second area that we look at is more to do with creating opportunities. Um, so thinking about um, a lot of the artists that we work with, maybe individually, they wouldn't have had these opportunities to access these global platforms. But as a collective, we recognize we have a much bitter, bigger audience and platform. So how can we use that collective platform to then give uh, different artists around our networks um, these you know, opportunities to be showcased, exhibited, and pushed forward. Um, so these were some of the shows that we worked on last year. Um, and we've been very fortunate to find sort of partner supporters that have made that possible for us because we're actually not um, formalized as a DAO. We very much remain an artist collective that has no sort of formal financial structure, which, you know, is also its own problem. Um, but yeah, so... These were the number of artists we showcased last year, 93 artists in total um, from 21 different countries across these shows. 
And uh, this is us last year at Art Dubai. We were very fortunate uh, to have been able to take part, um, which was what really inspired me for working on Art Dubai Digital this year because Chris had set that foundation of working with collectives, you know, like ourselves. So we basically were a booth run by like six different artists and me as the only non-artist as the curator, just running about the fair and experiencing you know, for these artists, their work being shown in this kind of context for that first time, what was that like and what did it mean for that practice, um, which really, I think, inspired me in the ways that we thought about the section this year. Um, and this is another show that we worked on. Um, and yeah, so that's just a little bit into my practice in NFT Asia. Thank you, Clara. Um, and next up, uh, Audrey be sharing about TR Lab, which is um, a great platform that focuses on bridging uh, the idea of art education and using Web3 and crypto as a way to sort of create a, a narrative, a story, a journey into how uh, someone might find out about artists and, and art in general. Hi, everyone. Very excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. There, Actually, Clara, as you were talking, there is so much that I wanted to respond to because even though I think on the surface it may seem like we're working on very divergent issues, I think at the core all that we want to do is to bring art to the forefront of enlarging the conversation around art and having more per more people participate and learn about art in different ways. So uh, Tier Lab, we are a platform that was incubated by Dragonfly Capital, which is a cryptocurrency fund based in Asia in 2021. And I and my family became involved as one of the co-founders because we had uh, founded Shanghai Rockband Art Museum back in 2010. And so I knew nothing about NFTs coming into the space. But from the get-go, I thought that there was something very interesting about these online communities that were forming that I felt like would encourage people to learn about art in many different ways. And so our mission has definitely shifted and became larger as we've grown. In the beginning, the idea was to bridge the digital and traditional art worlds. And then TR actually means tabula rasa. It comes from the Latin term of blank slate. And it's very much so about thinking about approaching this whole new world. There's so many different approaches we could take. And I think that uh, I think what we've centered on is this idea of fusing Web3 technology with fine art knowledge to really pioneer the future of collecting and participating in art. So what that means is we help artists and institutions enter into Web3 with uh, different technology to extend their mission and brand. And we have have become more known for more unique uh, educational type experiences that we do. And through our community platform, we enable collectors and enthusiasts to really gain access to art and education-based experiences where instead of using money to gain, uh, to gain access, you're really using the time and the effort that you're spending and learning to get to know the art world in a different way. So I firmly believe that uh, Web3 technology is at the center of how a lot of institutions and artists can think about their future because it helps them accomplish critical goals. The first thing is how do you engage and educate with new collectors? In Truman's, edu in Truman's presentation earlier, there is this idea of attention economy and now, how, now that younger people are used to things like TikTok and used to being on their phones and scrolling, how do you enable people to get deeper into your practice, your art or engaging with your institution. The second thing is creating a, a revenue and royalty streams with new experiences and digital collectibles. And the last is extending a lasting influence in this new medium of which more and more young people are now learning about art through seeing art on Instagram digitally or looking at digital art and understanding code-based art. So these are the three things that we really align on the partners that we work with as we're thinking about helping them enter in, into the space. So what we do is really a full service platform of tech to allow partners to leverage NFTs as a medium. We really spend a lot of time dreaming up the right experience for the art. And so with that, we actually do a lot of research on either a singular artist's practice or on the goals of our partners in coming into the space. 
And I'll dive into that a little later with our most recent partnership with the Calder Foundation. There's usually some sort of smart contract innovation involved. And then we think about the UI and UX experience and how to really get people in to make them feel like it's not something that's difficult to go through. How do we make sure to deliver the storytelling for both someone who has never heard about this artist before and also someone who has maybe been a fan but wants to get to the, know the artist on a different level. So we've been, uh, through our co-founders, we've had access to really amazing, really amazing artists. So I want to briefly talk about our project with Tsai Guo Qiang here, because I will then go into what we did with the Calder Foundation a little later on. With Tsai, we uh, did a project called Your Daytime Fireworks. And as a collector, you would actually collect a firework packet and uh, learn about Tsai's life. So about how things like weather, location, safety regulations can impact his IRL works, and also learn about special dates in Tsai's life. So for example, uh, his Guggenheim opening back in 2008. And with that knowledge armed in hand, you as a collector decide when you want to set off your firework packet and burn it, both literally and figuratively, to get your final artwork. And Tai really thought about it as an act of co-creation, where his one of his biggest wishes in his previous practice was to have collectors learn more about his art and be able to experience the birth of his uh, artworks. But obviously, as with fireworks and explosions, you're not going to be able to hand some gunpowder off to someone and say, hey, here, learn about, learn about my medium. And so, he thought uh, that it was a very fascinating way to get people involved in his practice. And he has since then began incorporating what this means, what this kind of co-creation means in his physical artworks. So I, we thought that that combination was really interesting. And it was very much so something that's only enabled by Web3 technology, where you cannot give someone a gunpowder in real life, but how can you in use this technology to enable collectors and enthusiasts to go deeper into an artist's medium? And uh, we're also fortunate to work with Vogue on a small curated collection that came out in August, but I want to spend a little more time talking about what we did with the Calder Foundation. I think the font, the font got messed up a bit, but uh, the Calder question, and this is a, uh, a project that's very near and dear to my heart. It was really a first of its kind uh, educational experience that we built using blockchain technology. And uh, the idea of it being called the Calder question was actually exactly that. Like, what does, it, what does it mean to ask a question? What does it mean to answer a question? And how are we going to use it to help people engage with Calder in a very different way online? So uh, funny backstory here, but I had first met Sandy Rower, who's Calder's grandson and the president of the foundation back in Art Basel, Miami in 2021. And he is very much so an NFT skeptic. In fact, the first time we talked to him, he said, NFTs and no F effing T time. So for us, I think it was uh, crazy to think about the fact now that we've launched this project and that they've been very, the foundation's been very happy with us about the success of the project was Sandy was not really interested in presenting Calder in a digital manner or in the financial uh, or in the financial revenue that they would be able to get in the blockchain. The foundation had already received more than 10 different proposals to do something on the blockchain and to do NFTs before us. But what we had brought to them was something a little bit out of the blue where uh, we showed Sandy the conversation that was happening in our Discord, which was people organically sharing museums that they're going to. And he said, they should be talking about Calder. And uh, so we actually created this quiz with the foundation where uh, it was a very tough esoteric quiz. I think, quiz, Chris, you may have yeah, seen I, I a little bit. Yeah, I definitely failed the third part like <laughs> two, two times. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a really tough quiz. And um, the way that we designed it was Sandy want, knew that people who passed the quiz would be able to get access to the foundation in some ways. And so he wanted to make sure that there were the people that spent time in order to do so. So I actually have a friend who's a curator who thought that uh, she didn't have to study before <laughs> going through the quiz and she in fact failed. And But however, we actually designed an educational portal where it was really a short 
click-through version of different tidbits and stories about Calder's early life and uh, mobiles that you can click through. And if you did that, you would be able to get 100%. So what with this quiz, one of the one of the questions that I that Chris mentioned that was very tough, like an example would be um, Duchamp was Duchamp was the artist that came up with the term mobile for Calder. Who was the artist who came up with the term stabile? And so it's definitely not things that you would be able to even Google easily. It's really about digging through the foundation's website, going through our education uh, education portal to prove their knowledge. But after you did all that, you would be able to the top. Um, people who passed were able to get a free NFT, which then served as a puzzle piece for an additional game where you had to figure out which mobile your puzzle piece belonged to, to unlock rewards and access to the foundation, including Calder Studio in Roxbury, Connecticut, which has never been open to the public, as well as the foundation spaces and future exhibitions around the world. And so we, Putting this quiz out there from the get-go, we knew that this was going to be a tough challenge. We didn't know how many people would come to join because going through the quiz and passing, it usually takes around 45 minutes at least on our website. So we were thinking about it like, how are we going to engage these people and who are these people going to be? We were expecting around 200 or 300 people to really be able to submit the experience and actually more around 1,200 people did. And more interestingly, there were a lot of people who wrote essay yet yeah, oh, I forgot to mention there was also an essay that you had to submit but a lot of people wrote essay answers that were more than a thousand words talking about how this has allowed them to learn about Calder's works and see them in new life including people who have never cared about Calder before or have heard the name or seen a mobile but didn't know more beyond what uh, a hanging mobile would mean and so I think that was a really fascinating thing to us because for me as a young art collector and enthusiast, and I feel very fortunate to have grown up in a collecting family, it's always been tough to think about how to get more people engaged in the conversation around art, how to get someone who doesn't care to say, hey, like, I have an interest or someone who says, I would be willing to go to a museum, but I would not be willing to read a book about art to spend more time. And I think that for us, Web3 technology and NFTs, there's really something here, a spark of something where this technology could be used for good, for, to, for people to learn on the blockchain, for any people anywhere around the world to access a computer and go through a game and say, hey, like this actually makes me want to learn more about art. And so in terms of our upcoming partnerships, a lot more that will be coming later this year, including season two of The Calder Question, will really be playing around this idea of like, how do you get people to learn more online in a digital experience about art and how do you get them to interact and then get them to want to go see the art in the physical world. I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I guess on that note, we're going to jump into some questions. And, uh, you know, at the beginning of the talk, I was mentioning that a lot of especially in the digital section, a lot of the participants and some of the speakers actually at GAF, uh, I think there's the thread that connects us all is this sort of um, uh, term I use called bridging. And it's, it's, it's used a lot in crypto where you bridge into another network. And so the question I wanted to pose to both of you is, you know, this area of bridging is not, uh, it's not an easy space because you're between two spaces and sometimes like you're not you're not pure crypto you're not pure trad art or wherever um, and I think the question I want to ask is you know what drives you both to work in this space that is taking on you know teaching people about digital art and crypto and sort of bring them in and and sort of you know diffusing the technology sure. um. Yeah, I think as someone who comes from the more quote unquote traditional art space, um, it's something that I've thought about a lot because as a curator, um, you know, especially I think two years ago, if I said, oh yeah, I work with NFTs, um, I think I was, you know, often dismissed or my peers might regard my practice as being just, you know, too commercial, it's not serious enough. Um, but I think, um, 
coming, looking at the space and especially with NFT Asia, seeing how many artists are genuinely looking to develop their practice, looking for ways to break out of systems in which they haven't had that kind of luxury of having, you know, infrastructural support, um, especially in kind of Southeast Asia, South Asia artists that I've been working with. Um, it's so important to really be present and be a part of that ecosystem, especially now when it's still nascent. Um, I think a lot of criticisms that, you know, maybe the quote unquote traditional world that I've had around me has had towards NFTs and blockchain have surrounded its ethics, uh, techno politics, sustainability, and so on. Um, and my personal stance is that I see that and I agree with a lot of the criticisms, but if you're not a part of the conversation, then how will you move it to change? Um, I, you know, I think with NFT Asia or with some of the shows that I've worked on, my hope and my belief is that by getting involved, by being present at conversations like this, that I could help build towards the culture that I believe in. Um, with NFT Asia, we were hoping to create a space that we felt was missing but crucial. And without us, could such a space be created? Maybe. You know, sure, I'm sure artists would have come together and figured something out anyway. Um, but I think, yeah, it's really about um, contributing towards what you feel is necessary. Um, it's so, so important, I think, to actually get involved in the space and understand what's going on. For example, when you look at the digital section this year, um, we've really tried to switch things up to look at not just, you know, traditional galleries, but to look at collectors who are building in the space. How are they working with artists? How are artists collectives taking over and, you know, collaborating with artists in the production process? And what does this all mean? There's so much that's sort of being shifted around. There's so much that's being challenged. Even what is a curator, I think, in the space is oftentimes being challenged. And I think that also helps keep me personally in check. Like, what am I doing? Um, who am I really serving with my work and with the collective? Um, and what is this alternative ecosystem that we're building? Is it really going to be so different or, you know, are we going to replicate the same issues, so on and so forth? So, yeah. So just responding to a couple of the things that you said, I think it's I think there's something very scary, but also wonderful about how nebulous the space is, what terms and roles and new definitions that are very being put through by as you said, like, what does it mean to be a curator? What does it mean to be a collector? And is it different from being a traditional collector? The roles uh, haven't been set yet. And I think that's also something that really attracts me to the space because there's no wrong way of doing things. And it's everyone is experimenting, trying to bring the space forward in different ways. And I, I think for me, my, my passion comes in two ways. The first is I think a lot about legacy and how legacy fades over time. And this actually came out with a conversation that I had with Sandy when he asked me uh, if I knew of Bob Dylan. And I said, of course I know of Bob Dylan. And he said, okay, name 15 songs that Bob Dylan, <laughs> Bob Dylan had written or sung, and I, and I couldn't. And, and he said, you know, <laughs> 100 years from now, I don't want someone to go into a museum and see a Calder and only recognize its form, but not know the name Calder or the artist's significance or the stories around his grandpa. And I don't. I think there's something very special in what we can do in pushing these legacies forward in the digital space where younger people don't really, a lot of younger people don't really care about going to museums. They're spending a lot more of their time online. They're spending a lot more time interacting in different ways. So how can we help in pushing this conversation forward? And that's something that I feel very passionately about as an, uh, an art lover. And the second part of it is I think there is something interesting here where we can be, get people who have never cared about art to care about art, whether it be crypto native traders who are first thinking about approaching art only as financial, only as financial investments. I think there's something uh, there's something that's even beginning to change these the past couple months of people things clicking in people's heads and saying like, oh, like I think that this would 
this would enable me to go into the art world. This would equip me with the knowledge to not feel like art is so intimidating. And uh, one example I can give is uh, one of my friends from college who is very early into Bitcoin uh, and has been living in New York for the past five years, but has never gone to any museum art related events. He, uh, I'd sent him what we're doing with the Calder question and he went through the experience and actually scored 100% somehow. And afterwards, a few weeks later, he texted me and he was going through JFK and he took a picture and he said, isn't that a Calder? And so I think there's something so special here to me that people are able to learn and interact with art in a new way. And do I know what the future looks like? Not really, but I think it's exciting enough that I want to try to be, as you said, part of the conversation to move the space forward and to move art forward. Thanks, yeah. I mean, who cares about the future anyways, right? It's, a, it's, about, the, it's about the present. <laughs> um, I mean, so despite us uh, you know, bridging um, with any sort of technological adoption or diffusion, um, you know, there's always exclusion and, you know, this is kind of a crass, I think, uh, sort of like term, but digital, digital divide, I feel is happening in the space where, um, you know, you know, not everyone is going to adopt some of this new technology right away. And, and some of my friends and collaborators, um, that have, you know, been new media artists for, for years pre, you know, pre this whole NFT cycle. Um, you know, some of them have adopted the technology and into their practice, and then some haven't. And you know, this is sort of something I want to just you know been trying to discuss more with people. Um, are you guys, you know, what are your guys thoughts or insights or observations in talking with different artists um, and practitioners in the space uh, with regards to adopting? Um, you know, NFTs, NFT technology is technology stack into their practice and into their work. So I think my definition of the NFT technology stack and when artists and foundations talk to us, we often urge them to think outside of just thinking about NFTs as an art medium or selling NFTs as art, because I think that there's a lot that could happen with proof of participation, proof of education, proof that you did something somewhere online that can be that are NFTs, but are not in the way that people are thinking about NFTs now. And that's something that we push forward in uh, in push forward with a lot of the partners that we work with. I think the second thing is. I am less interested in things around fractionalizing or saying, hey, like I have a physical work of art. I want to make this into an NFT. How do you convert it and make it into different pieces? I think there needs to be some sort of meaning behind the action, whether it be interactivity that's enabled by the blockchain, like what we did with Tai, or a lot of the other great projects out there that you know, requires some sort of twist for traditional artists that haven't previously used NFTs in their medium to come in and experiment in a new way. And we very much want to support them to do that. Yeah, I think for me, um, maybe because of the demographics of the artists that I mainly work with and talk to in this space, um, I think there are different kinds of divides um, that I've witnessed. Uh, for example, you know, I think this rhetoric around Web3, our hopes for it to be borderless, but the recognition that it very much is not. Um, you know, the artists that we have in the community, for example, in India, where there's different kinds of regulations surrounding uh, the trading of virtual assets versus, you know, if they were based somewhere else in the world. Um, how, what does that actually look like if they want to use NFTs as a way of putting their art forward? Uh, what does it mean when you come from a city where there hasn't been support for new media art? I think the artists in the NFT space that are based in, let's say, Berlin, have a very different reality with the kinds of environments they have in their city and around them, the kind of physical infrastructure that supports their work, as opposed to, say, you know, an artist from, um, let's say, somewhere in Southeast Asia. Um, so I think just, you know, that very base layer, the kind of like hardware or physical infrastructural divide, um, but also within the space, um, thinking about artists that have had, let's say, that kind of support and exposure to, you know, the traditional art world, let's say having gone to art school, having worked with curators in the past, 
having that kind of art lexicon or art will, you know, art speak um, that allows them to translate or communicate their practice in a certain light, as opposed to artists who are just doing what I think is really cool and really important. Um, and sometimes it's the way that you communicate your practice, it's the way that you put it forward that makes a difference between someone taking you seriously and someone thinking, oh, this is just a JPEG, um, as harsh as that may sound. Um, and those kinds of divides are still very much real. Part of that is because there aren't enough curators or cultural workers like us going around, um, supporting the space or taking kind of these emergent practices seriously enough, I think, um, to recognize that there are different kinds or different shapes, formations of practices emerging as much as, say, with the section we're trying to think about how the cultural entities and players um, are looking, you know, look different now and may move towards different kinds of ecosystems. Um, so yeah, I think you know there's a lot of different kinds of divides. Unfortunately, I feel like you're like very the positive, and I. Like <laughs> we have a few minutes left, and I just wanted to end on this sort of note. Um, you know, I think Schumann posed this question uh, to a panel Clara and I were on a few weeks ago, um, and it's basically the idea of hope. And I think you know, in a time where you know hope is quite a scarce resource. Uh, what are you guys hopeful for in the space um, in terms of, I guess, in your own practice or what you're seeing or what can people look out for? I think I'm a hopeful person. <laughs> So there's lots of things that, that, there's lots of things that I feel optimistic about. I think if I had to pick one, I would say that since the since the bear market and and since what's happened within crypto it really hasn't slowed down the number of partners that are coming to us wanting to learn about the space and i think interestingly the conversations have become more focused on long term what are the benefits and not just not uh, not as focused on the short term reception of projects or partnerships but more what can you do with this technology that hasn't been done before and so that's something that I'm very hopeful about that, you know, the interest that hasn't died down despite what the overall narrative might be about the space that a lot of people, you know, people like Clara, a lot of curators, hopefully more curators coming in in the next year are working consistently throughout the, the past year and the market conditions haven't turned away people's enthusiasm for getting deeper into the space. Yeah, I think not to shill the section, but um, the past couple of days, I think being here at Art Dubai, meeting different curators, meeting a lot of visitors, press, has actually given me renewed hope for what we're doing. Frankly, I think for the past year, maybe, I've been feeling a little jaded in the space. You know, we started out with this idea that we want to push against a current. But of course, when you when you set out with this kind of idea, along the way, eventually you get tired, you feel frustrated, you lose some of your teammates that you started out with, and you start asking yourself, what is this all for and who are we really supporting? But coming here and then realizing that, you know, actually there's a lot of serious questions being asked around what is art on the blockchain? What do these ecosystems look like? And how can each of us playing different roles build and contribute towards this ideas of different kinds of futures has made me feel like, okay, you know, maybe maybe we're on to something. And yeah, it makes me look forward to see. I think Brian in the Outland um, review of the section talk, uh, talked a bit about this, um, about this idea of this multiplicity of futures, that maybe there isn't a singular idea of that path, but the possibilities of there being more, you know, uh, lines or streams or in channels that we can move towards, that makes me hopeful. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.